Welcome to 558 Parkside Tech, where we talk about tech's past, present, and future. Today, we're talking about mainframe COBOL developers moving to object-oriented programming. In the words of Zig Ziglar, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. So let's get into it right after this. 558 Today we're talking about COBOL developers moving to object oriented programming. In today's world, with everything being on your iPhones or on your tablets or with self-driving cars now and with just the technology just moving so fast, AI, you name it. I think all COBOL developers need to have some reference or understanding of object-oriented programming. And many times when they make that jump, it always seems to be very difficult because the people that are usually teaching it are from the object-oriented side. And there's no really no comparison to what, it, what COBOL programmers are normally doing. As you know, in most organizations, I don't care where you work, if it's been around a while, whether it be government or a power company who've been around maybe longer than 20 years, they were using some kind of IBM mainframe, which ran COBOL, CICS, DB2, OSJCL. And I think before OSJCL, they used to run DOS. I don't think anybody's running DOS anymore. If you are, that's a really old company. But anyway, if you're running an old mainframe and you were trying to do with the advent of phones and tablets and the like, you have to have some kind of front end present that connects to those devices. And what you'll find is a lot of companies will run the mainframe in the background to crunch the do the heavy lifting, to crunch the numbers for the customers that they've had for 30 or 40 years because of government mandate that they keep seven years of data. They usually have a more fluent modern front end that deals with JSON, XML, and WSDLs which the front end applications are able to handle, whether you're being on prem, meaning in your own office for those that aren't real technical, or if you're dealing with the cloud, you have some kind of presence and those two are working together. So you might at night dump all your data down to a front end process and that front end process is gonna be doing some kind of object oriented language. So what is the difference between COBOL and object oriented languages? It's not the thing that I heard in a class one time. I heard an instructor once say that the reason why all the COBOL legacy systems are going away is because it was redundant code. Not true, not in the least. In fact, that's garbage. Object-oriented programming, they say, is to be able to reuse code. As you know, if you're a COBOL programmer, you reuse code in COBOL. If you had a read statement in COBOL, if you needed to read the database again, you didn't write another one. You used the same COBOL read statement. If you had an edit paragraph, you used the same edit paragraph when you were editing the data. So the purpose of moving to object-oriented programming has nothing to do with reusable code, negative. So if you hear that, throw that in the trash. The purpose of going to it is it's enabled to interface with front-end pieces, your phones, your tablets, your desktops. Now with cars, with everything, you need an object-oriented language. COBOL can't do that. Your front end for COBOL was what? CICS, the gr big old green screen of death, we used to call it. All right, so that's the main reason. So the difference is object-oriented programmers use objects, COBOL uses paragraphs. For example, here, if you look here, the average programmer, COBOL programmer, had you know the four divisions and you had 01 levels for, for all your data fields. You had 88 or 77 dealing with your switches. And then you had your main paragraphs that performed all the work. If you look real close, you probably never thought of this, but everything is separated. So in other words, when I wanted to lift and shift this code, if I wanted to copy this code to do numbers, I'd have to take the data from the work and storage division. If you had an FD, I'd have to take the data from your FD. I also would have to take the data from the procedure division, move all that into another program. Well, that's the big difference. Because if I look at the definition of what is object-oriented programming, so if you were to type what I typed here, why object-oriented programming? Here, I'm gonna give you the definition. When I read it, it's gonna sound like tabuki to you because you don't know what it means, but I'm gonna to try to explain what it means. Objects that contain data and methods, that's the key. Remember what I said, 
and COBOL, your data, or your 77 levels, 88 levels, or one levels were in one place. The method in this case would be paragraphs. So let me just continue reading it without stopping. Objects that contain data and methods. The data in forms of fields also known as attributes and properties. And the code is in the form of procedures also known as methods. OOP, short for Object Oriented Programming, is based on the concept of classes which have templates for creating objects. Now, when I read that when I first started many years ago, it didn't make any sense to me, none at all. I tried to memorize it, but it didn't make any sense to me. So let me see if I can explain it. Here's an example, um, not a great example, but an example that I want you to keep in mind. You see where it says methods? It says class, professor, properties, name, teachers, method. Ah, under methods, it has these grade and introduce self. And it has these two brackets like things that is your paragraph in COBOL that's where all the work's going to happen but that method is within the class and if you look at the class called professor it has properties name and teacher so if you notice that class is what we call an object an object is an instance of a class let me say it again an object is an instance of a class they're synonymous so whenever I have when I say object-oriented programming, I'm really talking about classes. So in this class, I've got a method, AKA for you COBOL developers, I have a paragraph, okay? But also, here's the key. I've got my O1, my WS, my 88, everything within the class. Think about that for a second. I've got everything that I need in the class. So if I wanted to copy this class or use this class, everything that's needed is there. Unlike with COBOL, I'd have to go to the, the work and storage division, go grab all the switches, I have to grab the FD, then I have to grab the procedure. That is the major, major difference. And that's what throws a lot of COBOL programmers when they're switching to uh, .NET or object-oriented programming. Now here's an example of that same code that I just showed you, where I had numbers as an 01 and I had uh, no more records as an 88 level. Here, that 88, for our example, and I want you to memorize this, that 88 turns into an enum. And then I could still put more records, no more records, and interrogate the enum to ask if there's more, more, more records or no more records. The same here, that number, which was an 01 uh, field, I now have a public int. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, we still have slashes uh, to denote comments in C-sharp. And above it, let me show you this. Up here where it says using, that threw me when I first saw it. What does using mean? Using, whenever you see these using statements, is that I'm writing code and I want it to be grabbed by the translator. You notice when you're in COBOL, if you're co compiling COBOL code, you have a COBOL translator that translates all your COBOL code that you're writing. If you have CICS, you have a CICS translator. And if you have DB2, you have a DB2 translator. This is the same thing. So these using statements says, I'm going to be using some kind of um, collection, generic. So if I start to write a collection generic, it's able to understand it because I have here system collection generic. It's almost like having a translator. It's almost like if I'm about to speak Spanish, I'd have using Spanish there. So if I wrote some Spanish, as I do my compile in C Sharp, it's called a build it's able to translate that. Hopefully that makes sense. Now here's an example of an actual c -sharp program, okay? So I wanted you to see the formatting of it. We, I just talked to you about system using and why we use system using collection, generic, link, text, is because I'm gonna be writing that type of code and I want the compiler to be able to interpret it properly. I'm showing you that, look at the brackets. See how it's grouping things? See where it says namespace, console, house, example? Then it has a bracket. I always get bracket and braces kind of thrown off. I'm just gonna say bracket, you know what I mean here. So here I've got a class. Within that class, I've got a number of fields. That's what you would call them. And I'm calling them public string. And I'm giving it the name of that is called color room. 
I've also got bedroom size. I've also got nightstand. I got these different attributes that are all here, okay? We used to call them fields, but it's the exact same thing in COBOL. And here's the kicker, public void style. I'm not gonna explain what void means, but that style is your paragraph in COBOL, right? But look, it's all grouped together. It's all, here's a word that you don't use in COBOL. It's encapsulized, everything's in one place. Here's a translation of what we do in COBOL that's a little different. All right, it's real simple. All your X alphanumerics, if you look down here, they're strings. We call them strings in C sharp. The same thing with your 903s, which are your numeric three position. Here we go. It looks like what? An integer. So here, there's not that big, nothing here that's really complicated. They don't do any packing. I mean, you know, packing's kind of old school. We used to do pack threes and packs back in the day to save space. We used to pack data. They don't do a lot of that uh, in the .NET world. There seems to be a lot of space, whereas on the mainframe back in the day, there wasn't a lot of space. So you did a lot of packing. Now, some of the differences between COBOL and C-sharp. As you know, if you're in COBOL, using ISPF as your editor, all right? You're writing all your code. You know, when you first get a job, the first thing you do is you create a bunch of data sets, one for COBOL, one for JCL, you know, prox. You create all these different data sets and you do everything in ISPF, all right? Well, in C Sharp, they use Visual Studio. Same thing, it's, an IS, it's not an ISP, it's an editor, all right? And you write all your code and do everything. But the thing about it is it's a little bit more powerful. I probably shouldn't say a little bit more powerful. It is more powerful. It has IntelliSense, so as you're writing code, it actually tells you what's wrong with your code. If you're missing a semicolon, if you're missing a bracket, it helps you along the way. Whereas you know with COBOL, you gotta write all your code, compile it just to see your errors, and then go to sys out and grab everything, fix it, then compile it again. It becomes a crazy exercise, especially if you're new. You seem like you're doing that all day. It also has a thing called Copilot, which is relatively new within the past year. Copilot actually makes code suggestions for you. He looks at your code and sees what you're doing and says, hey, this might be a better way of doing it. Also, there's a third-party tool called ReSharper. ReSharper restructures your code for you as you go along. And also, when you're doing your testing, you're using OSJCL to run your test. Okay, it's something that you've set up on the side. You got your step lives, you got all that. Well, with C Sharp, you actually can write your test cases. And most of your object on your long images, you can write your test cases right within your code. So that's some of the differences. So that's something that shouldn't scare you at all either. It's just in different place and actually is more friendly. The thing I wanted to point out, <laughs> I didn't want to make this a very long video, is the most important thing in object-oriented languages is the semicolon. I was a semicolon killer. I used to leave it out all the time because I come from a language where we just put period at the end of it. You got to use a semicolon the end of statements, all right? It's important you remember that. Very important, all right? So now in conclusion, I've kind of rambled on for almost 15 minutes, but I wanted to give you COBOL guys a head start so that some of you don't start looking at your 401k, trying to figure out when you can retire, when they start talking about, uh-oh, we're about to go to .NET, you gotta learn um, object-oriented programming. I don't want you to run. You might be a little older, but you still may have some years left in the game. I want you to be able to jump in. So in conclusion, I want to let you know, and I've outlined in this conversation, that most shops are going to have some kind of web presence. There is going to be some presence that interacts with the phone so that customers can check their policy or their balance. They're going to have a front end piece. All right. And that front end is going to be to the, to the phone or to their tablets. All right. Also, you might want to learn object oriented programming now to add to your skill set before it's needed. You don't want to wait till your company makes that change and end up letting you go before you're ready to go. You want to just kind of jump in and start learning some C sharp. And also, last but not least, get your arm around the semicolon. As you're learning a language, I don't care if it's Java or C sharp, I use C sharp here in this example. You want to make sure you get your arms around understanding the, the semicolon. And last but not least, I saw this quote and I thought I would share it with you. It says, the man who can and the man who says he can't, they both are correct. So if you say you can't learn object-oriented programming, you're right. But if you say you can, I believe you can. And remember, there are only four things that you actually do in writing code. 
If you know what that is, then go to one of my other videos and you'll see exactly what I mean. All right, that's all I got. Thank you for joining me today. And if this information is of benefit to you, please feel free to subscribe and hit the like button. You can also join me at 558parksidetech.com for additional videos on object-oriented programming. I hope this information was beneficial to some of those IBM mainframe developers and their quest to move into object-oriented programming. As always, be greater than your greatest excuse and continue to learn tech. That's all I got. I'm Mike. Peace. Yeah, yeah, 558 Park Site Tech in effect, that take 558 Park Site Tech in effect, fe, 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 fe. tap in the future, let me introduce ya, 558 Park Site Tech, about to school ya, 558 Park Site Tech in effect, fe, 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 fe. 558 Park Site Tech in effect, fe, fe, fe. 558 Park Site Tech in effect, fe, 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 fe. Park, 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 Park Site.